Our final presentation will be from Yolo Achille Robinson, founder and executive director of BEAM, the Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective, an organization dedicated to removing the barriers that Black people experience around mental health access and support. Yolo was recently awarded the prestigious Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Equity Award for his work. We are so fortunate that he can be with us today to share in this conversation. Yolo? Yes, thank you so much. So first, let me just say thank you to my co-presenters for really offering a robust ground and framework for me to have this conversation. And also, of course, to Nickham for inviting me to be a part of this dialogue. Um, it means a lot to have our work um, as a part of this discussion. Um, as we shared, my name is Yolo Philly Robinson. I'm the executive director and founder of BEAM, the Black Emotional Mental Health Collective. Um, BEAM is a national training, movement building, and grant making institution, um, as, as um, was shared. And what I'd like to do today is actually talk a little bit about our work and our approach and our model as it comes to addressing mental health, as well as kind of highlight some specific things that I think can be helpful in terms of thinking about um, mental health in the workplace from a healing justice theoretical approach and perspective. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is in a moment as well. Um, so let me see, let me sure I'm going to use the tool right. Okay. So. Um, I want to talk about first the three buckets of our work, which will really be a great way to kind of understand how we conceptualize and understand mental health, first of all. Um, so the first piece of our work is that BEAM is primarily a training institution. And, um, but our training is built on the premise that we can't just rely on psychiatrists, social workers, or therapists for our communities to heal and be well. In fact, when it comes to black communities, we recognize that very few of us actually do rely on those institutions as they're often inter interconnected with the criminal legal system, systems that continually um, create a lot of violence and harm towards black and brown communities. And so understanding that, we recognize that we need to do something called village care. Um, we recognize that the people who are on the front lines of emotional health and support in our communities are often not those social workers and therapists, but are often teachers, coaches, educators. They are often activists, big mamas, cousins, family members. And that when those folks have the support skills and tools to be able to support, um, to show up, then, then our communities are able to cultivate wellness. However, when those folks are barriers to care, they can become, um, they can come, they, they can increase systemic barriers and really keep people from getting access to their needs or their wellness, right? One story that I often tell that kind of emphasizes why we do the work and the approach to the work that we do is there's a story about a young woman who was living in the rural South, um, got a diagnosis from a clinician of living with bipolar, and but however, when she got that diagnosis, her family and her religious community rejected that diagnosis and told her that that was not genuine, that was not real. Um, and so because of that, she suffered many of the different challenges of what it, what it was like to live with bipolar untreated for several years until one day she was sitting down with a stylist who was doing her hair. And the woman tells her, um, and she shares with her about her diagnosis at one point and also her family's response. And the stylist says, well, hold on, that doesn't make any sense. Like I have a cousin who's living with bipolar. Let me tell you what she went through. And you can't listen to those people because like that's not true. Because we gave her a different narrative, a different story. And due to that, she was able to actually get access to treatment. She, she was encouraged to get access to treatment, got access, and actually was able to show up in her own body and in her own life in a more, in her own words, in a way that was more in dignity for herself. So this is one of the reasons that our training and our education really focuses on village care and training folks who are not just clinicians, but people in every aspect of the community to really be able to do what we call healing justice, peer support, and show up and, um, and, and show up for our community. Um, a part of when I say healing justice, I want to make sure that that term may be new to people. Healing justice is a theoretical approach to healing and wellness that is rooted in the activism of black, queer, trans, disabled women and gender nonconforming folks from the South. Um, it really situates that we cannot heal until we actually address the core issues in our society that perpetuate unwellness, whether it is a commitment to hyperproductivity, whether it's capitalism and how sometimes capitalism can um, create um, harm and pain, um, whether it is also racism, sexism, homophobia, and all these other systems that are interconnected. So it is not about treating the symptoms, but also addressing the core issues that create so much distress in black and brown communities. And so our training approach is really centered in that particular piece, right? Um, so when our barbers, when our educators, and our counselors have those skills and tools, then our community is able to cultivate wellness in conjunction with mental health professionals as well. Next piece I'll talk about is our grant making and our community organizing. Very briefly, um, we, we believe in building upon and expanding ideas of what constitutes mental health. 
the medical model often says the only mental health work is being done in this country is being done by people who are clinicians, who are psychiatrists. Well, we reject that. We recognize that when Black Lives Matter activists are out in the streets advocating for an end to police brutality and the murder of black and brown people, that that is a mental health intervention. It is addressing our anxiety, our depression. It is addressing the distress that's fueling a variety of different mental health symptoms in our communities, right? And so we recognize and expand our understanding of wellness and mental health to be beyond the medical model by also emphasizing the brilliance and expertise of mental health professionals, when, um, but also challenging the systems as well for some of the ways in which they can perpetuate racism, sexism, um, and inaccessibility. So we fund everything from doulas, doing well, birth work support for black women. We fund herbalists who are doing um, herbal medicine for communities. We fund people doing barbershop education um, because we feel like, once again, it has to be on different pieces and elements. Third piece. I'm going to talk about, which is really kind of um, helps build upon what, what, what I'm here to talk about, organizational wellness. So, uh, so when we talk about organizational wellness and, um, and, and in this particular moment, we, as you might have garnered already, take a little bit of a more of a radical approach in terms of thinking about what, how do we actually cultivate wellness for our institutions and our systems and our community-based organizations? How do we help them center healing? How do we actually help them actually effectively address racism, sexism, and, tra and, um, and integrate restorative and transformative justice practices into their work? Understand that this is not going to be an eat, pray, love moment. It will not be sensitive and, and, and lovely and always beautiful. It will be difficult. It will be long term. It will require um, a deeper kind of engagement with the work. And so a lot of our work is going in-house with institutions, um, some corporate institutions, but primarily community-based and grassroots institutions to really help them to cultivate wellness uh, for the folks who work there, but also for how they deliver services for the folks and who work there as well. So that being said, I'm just going to briefly uh, touch, I'm going to skip to slide six, actually. So let me just talk about some things that we've been encouraging folks to think about when it comes to cultivating wellness in the workplace. And I, see, I can imagine people seeing the slide being like, okay, he's going to go there. And yes, I am. So the first thing I think is really important, when we're talking about racial justice, we're talking about economic justice, we need to talk about the fact that during COVID and this particular moment, um, the reality is that many people have lost their jobs. And there are many institutions that um, have staff who are, supporting multiple family members who have lost their jobs. For example, there are many of our, many of our clients who report that high percentages of their own staff are supporting um, paying rent for their parents, paying rent for cousins, paying rent for grandparents who have lost income that they had prior to this particular moment because they were in the service industry, are doing a variety of other, other kind of economic, um, other, other economic, economic um, ways that we're getting money that are no longer available to them. So we talked about we talked to organizations about giving bonuses to staff as a way to help support wellness, right? To actually help support their long-term investment in the staff, but also helping support people's mental health because the economic um, stress is a real issue right now. Second one I want to talk about is reassessing workloads and expectations of productivity. We in this country have ridiculously high and unhealthy ideas of productivity that have to be interrogated at the core. Right, they are deeply rooted sometimes in very ableist concepts and very racist concepts, and often um, not 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 really equivocated or connected to like you know how people are being compensated very well, right? And so one of the things I tell people when I work with executive directors is the the first thing we have to understand when you're in a leadership role, whether you're a manager or an executive director, is that you hold such a the the, the model that you the way you model the way you lead either helps or hinders the mental health of the people who are in your institution. And so, and so it's really critical that when we're in this moment, we understand that we are working through a crisis and that that crisis is going to have a diminish, it's going to diminish the impact in the ways in which we're going to be able to show up. So we need to reassess workloads and expectations of productivity. We need to be realistic. We need to really realign and reimagine. Um, some other simple things I put here, like stopping compulsive Zoom meetings. I can't tell you how often that, like, I'm, I'm going in house with institutions and organizations, and everything is now with Zoom because it's become almost compulsive. And it's like actually, and like, instead using Zoom time for integrated, intentional, like, really building relationships, not just because I need to jump on a call for this one small thing, right? It actually is exhausting. We're experiencing a lot of fatigue because we are now sharing space for, with people in ways we were not sharing space. You're seeing people's homes, people's bedrooms, which produces a little bit of anxiety, right, and, and frustration for people. So really acknowledging that and stopping that particular piece. 
Um, challenging compulsive urgency anxiety. I think the nonprofit industrial complex really struggles from urgency anxiety or urgency addiction is what people call it. Um, really being able to, we have a couple of tools we share to really help people begin to assess out what is urgent and what is my anxiety and how am I using my anxiety? Um, how, how, do, how does my anxiety show up in ways that make me constantly want to produce, 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 create, 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 so that I don't have to be present with my own fears, my own frustrations, are you using work as an, as an escape mechanism but having a negative impact on people in the, in the workplace, right? And so we see this happening a lot in um, a lot of spaces and a lot of organizations. I tell people to create water cooler time, time to share on non-work-related things. This has been a really big thing that many, many of our clients have found helpful. We talk about building in an hour, um, maybe once or twice a week where staff meet together and just be able to check in about like what's going on in their lives, whether it's their dog, whether it's what's going on with their kids, whether it's what's going on with like, you know, what they're watching on television. Like right now, because we are all in this virtual space, many of us don't get the opportunity to really sit around the water cooler or to have those conversations that really help sustain and nurture us in our work. And so it's really important that we build in time to just be like, hey, what's going on with you? How are you? You know, what's going, how are things happening? You know, those pieces are really important. Um, I'm going to say this last, next one is, um, and people might see it in kind of a, some people are hopefully see it in the room and like realize the necessity of it. Um, stop forcing black people and brown people into conversations about race with white people at work. I'm going to say it one more time. Stop forcing black folks into conversations about race with white people at work. There is a tendency in the DNI world to create these spaces that create so much distress and duress for black folks, um, where black folks are forced to, often with superiors, or people who are superior are in the hierarchy above them, help hold and address racism right, help hold and address transphobia or misogyny. I want to, I really want to encourage people to really think critically about how the people they engage when they do these particular models that is actually not helpful for many black folks. Most black folks are like, I don't want to talk to you about race. Many women be like, I don't want to talk to you about the misogyny and sexism in this space because actually there are so many consequences for myself when I do that, that it actually is, it creates um, more health challenges for me or more wellness challenges for me. So thinking about creative ways, how do we educate white people about their racism without having black people do that labor? How do we educate um, cisgender people about their cis sexism without having trans folks do that labor? What does that look like, right, in this moment when so much murder of trans folks is happening, so much race, so, uh, so much increased police violence is happening, or our awareness of it at least, what are the things, what are the strategies we can do that do not put the burden on the people impacted to explain to the people who are not as impacted about it? Um, last two pieces is wellness surveys. Um, really ha talking to people about what's going on in the office around race, gender, sexual orientation, and conflict challenges. What is the real culture? You know, a lot of times when we talk about mental health, we tend to externalize it, but we really think about like how is, what is the environment that we are cultivating in terms of for people to be able to express their feelings, to be heard? What does that look like, right? And then the last one is emotionally intelligent leadership training, which really encompasses all of this and is a large part of what we do. Um, really holding space for us to begin to hold the nuances of all these pieces. Um, one of the pieces that we talk about at BEAM in our work is we don't ask the question, are you racist, sexist, or transphobic? We don't think that's a helpful question to ask. The question that we think is more useful is, where is the racism, the sexism, the transphobia, the homophobia that you've learned all your life as a person living in this world, showing up in your behavior, ideas, and choices, so we're not exempt, none of us. So as a person myself, as a non-binary person, born in the body, projected and read as male, I've received innumerable psychological and social benefits from the system of patriarchy that benefits men. It says that men and maleness are dominant and have the right to rule. It says the characteristics that are masculine and male should be um, praised more than those characteristics associated with women and femininity, right? And because of that, whether I consider myself a good person or not, I have internalized ideas that show up in my behaviors and my treatment of other women in my space, right? And so the question is never, am I sexist, but where is the sexism showing up? And it's not about being of the moral question. It's about the reality we all internalize these things. So for white folks in the room who feel they are good people, the question is not about you being a good person or a bad person. It's about how is the racism and the ways in which you have internalized it unconsciously and not so unconsciously showing up in the ways in which you are treating black and brown folks, trans folks, queer folks in your space, because we all learn messages 
that certain lives are less valuable. And whether we um, are conscious of them or not, they show up in the way we are in the world. I am a three-minute marker. I know I've said a lot. I just want to, like, um, really briefly just go over some quick pieces. We have some really great tools on our website to help with conversations about, like, these pieces. I want to invite you to visit at bean.community. It is not bean.com. It is bean.community. People often think to ask that. And some of these tools are really great tools to begin to think about how do you build up your capacity to really have conversations around mental health and wellness in your space. Um, someone mentioned mental health first aid. And earlier, we think mental health first aid is a great program. However, one of the challenges of mental health first aid is it is divorced of any kind of historical context, and it often focuses heavily on diagnoses as opposed to focusing on giving people skills. We do not believe that people who are not peer support workers, who are not clinicians, need to know in the ins and outs of diagnosis. They need to understand some symptoms, and they need to have skills and strategies to show up for folks, understanding that it will be different in different communities, whether that's Black, Latinx, Asian, Pacific Islander, or Native communities. Um, and so we have some tools here to like that you can learn more about on our website. We encourage you to visit and share. Um, we also have our Black Virtual Wellness Directory, which um, features a variety of Black wellness professionals who can help with um, supporting um, folks with Black virtual wellness care. So that thing leads us. My time is up. You can um, learn more on our website, being dot community. You can sign up for our uh, our list serve as well, and um, find more about our work there. And I'll stop. Great, thank you so much, Yolo, for sharing your approach and model and sharing those helpful and key steps to cultivate wellness in the workplace. 